amazing human, human being and performer, Story Devereaux. Newness from underneath the plastic, a classic burned on black wax in fabrics of age old glamor. In between the grooves, I create magic. This is how Story Devereaux describes her artistry. Known for her muted trumpet vocals, poetry, storylines of socially conscious issues, and with heavy influences of jazz and 70s soul music, Story Devereaux delivers performances high in emotion with a sprinkle of sultriness that will make you fall in love with reflecting. This Chicago native and self-named storyteller, spelled S-T-O-R-I-E-T-E-L-L-E-R, embodies the name she denotes. A former student of Columbia College Chicago, Story majored in poetry with a secondary major in music composition. Story enhanced her innate understanding for songwriting while expounding on her ability to infuse poetry with jazz, cultivating a sound tailored to her, style, her vocal styling. Poems became spoken word, spoken word became song. You can learn so much more about Story on her website, storydevereaux.com. We have her here tonight. Please turn on your applause emojis and join me in welcoming Story Devereaux. Thank you so very much, Kim, and thank you so much to Action Pink. I thank you so much for having me here. I'm so blessed, and this is my very first Zoom opportunity, so I'm going to do the very best I can, <laughs> and I'm going to jump right into it. This actual piece is actually called MUVA, M-U-V-A. We are living, we are living in an age of grace. But it has been anything but amazing. Flowers grow through concrete. Jesus bless the babies. Police carry coffins and holsters. Their spirits are colored in white sheets in the faces of their black neighbors. I just saw her yesterday. I literally just saw her yesterday. She was standing with the Sada in a ghetto Magna Carta black fist to her chest. She had healing in her walls. But woe to the earth. How do you explain to her that she was born to hurt? And she was born to birth. And our purpose is colored purple. But see, they think there's no God in our church. So they don't think there's any God in our worth. That's why you find brothers and sisters on the corner smoking spirits while they search it. They lift lighters for their idols. Homeboy will be released in about 1,200 hours. But before those hours, he was behind bars. They told him to read between the lines. So he grabbed the Quran said next to Allah, witness full blood moons to full white moons. There are symbols in the sky. But before we move higher, we got to set this place on fire because there's far too many gods and not enough messiahs. Don't teach me to be fly. The fly is living illusion. Confusion on the tube brings confusion to the mind. We covet what we seek. That's why resolutions are on the decline and disputes are on the rise. White nationalists are on the rise. Trump held the Bible in his right hand, demonized it right before your very eyes. Like robots and androids. Samsung, your liberty and those shiny, pretty things. And no cost to you, just sign your name, just sign your name, just sign your name. And it'll give you work before you rest. It'll give you fame before success. 
Because resting in your head keeps your dreams in the bed. Shorten lifespan like eating greens from a can. You pick your veggies fresh. Let your perfect thoughts manifest. Let your spirit be free. Let your pockets be free. Let your mind be free. That old neck turner kind of free. That old Harriet Tubman kind of free. That old Ozzy and Ruby deep dipped in black love kind of free. Because my people, how can we win the revolution if we have yet to be connected to our evolution? And that's my piece. Yes. I love the way you just dropped the mic at the end there, Story. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Thank wow. You. That was just wonderful. And, uh, you know, again, put those praises in the chat box, all those emojis, all the love, send it. We'll see it later. We can't see it right now, but um, I felt that story and, and it was such a gift and a perfect way for us to start this conversation. Uh, so thank you again for that. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to ground our discussion in addition to what Story just shared uh, by quoting from a recent public statement written by my sister colleague and one of tonight's panelists, Aisha Davis, titled Until We Are All Free. And it's posted on AFC's website and I encourage folks to take a look at the full statement when they get a chance. So Aisha writes, right now there is no liberation if Black trans lives are not centered. Without a lens that centers our most marginalized, we cannot recognize and address the deepest harms facing our communities. If we center the communities located at the intersection of all the systems of oppression, we can build a future where everyone can meet their needs. That's the spirit with which we intend to hold tonight's conversation. And I'm gonna read the introductions or the bios of the panelists, because I believe in giving people their flowers while they're alive. And uh, these, these folks are doing amazing work. Um, so first is Aisha N. Davis Esquire. Aisha is Director of Policy at AIDS Foundation of Chicago. She was born and raised in, Was in the Washington DC metro area, otherwise known as the BMV to those of you in the area. Uh, Aisha attended Col Columbia Law School and participated in a dual degree program with the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. And at the conclusion of her dual degree program, Aisha obtained a JD and an LLM specializing in human rights, conflict and justice. Throughout the course of her legal education, Aisha has worked on human and civil rights, both domestically and internationally. And Aisha's scholarship on intersectional issues has been featured in the Columbia Journal, Gender and Sexuality Law Online, and the Harvard Human Rights Journal. She has also enjoyed blogging, and her work has been featured on The Frisky, for Harriet, and the Center for Intersectional and Social Policy Studies blog. That's Aisha. Miles Brady Davis is a Black, trans, masculine, two-spirit person of faith. As a native Chicagoan raised in Hyde Park, they grew up in a loving family, then emphasized strong values and tenets of faith, inclusivity, and social justice. Following in the footsteps of their father after college, Miles continues in the pursuit of civil rights advocacy. Miles has worked with various community-based organizations and served as a collective member for the Transformative Justice Law Project of Illinois, the governing board uh, for United Way of Metro Chicago's United Pride Executive Committee, Pride Action Tank, Trans Lifeline, and participated in the hashtag InstaPride campaign curated by Miley Cyrus's Happy Hippie Foundation and Instagram. Miles is a champion of the marginal, marginalized consciousness and community building. Miles is married to precious Brady Davis, the love of his life, and they have one beautiful child, baby Zion. That's Miles. Megan Mari is 
Policy Director for the National LGBTQ Task Force, which currently runs the Queer the Census campaign. Megan's work spans a broad range of issue areas, but focuses heavily on economic justice, the criminal legal system, and data collection. Megan received an associate's degree from Holyoke Community College, bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Massachusetts, and a law degree from Georgetown University of Law. Megan uses their personal and professional experience to inform their work and is particularly focused on how economic systems and the criminal legal system impact people who live at the intersections of multiple marginalized identities. So welcome, Megan. And last but not least, Masaya Wade is an open Afro Puerto Rican indigenous trans woman, founder of TNTJ, Tennessee Trans Journey Project, and member of Chicago Transgender Nonconforming Collective and the Trans Liberation Collective. She is the founder and executive director of Brave Space Alliance, the first black led, trans led LGBTQ center located on the south side of Chicago, dedicated to creating and providing affirming, culturally competent, for us, by us, resources, programming, and services for LGBTQ individuals on the south and west sides of the city. Masaya has over 10 years of experience in organizing and advocacy work with Black, Indigenous, trans, and gender nonconforming people around the world and earned a Master of Business Administration degree from, and I practice saying this, Masaya, so let me see if I get this right. Murfreesboro, Tennessee State University. <laughs> that is a Southern gal right there. <laughs> so uh, again, an amazing, amazing panel, and I'm so happy that you all uh, agreed to be here tonight. So now that you know who's here, let's get started. Um, we were doing a little chatting before the program started, and I think we all agree that it's an understatement to say that 2020 will go down in history as a year to remember. Uh, as if a global pandemic wasn't enough, there is a rumble moving across the world as protests emerge in united anger about the murder of George Floyd by police and solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. And lest we forget, this is also a presidential election year, and there are also many local elections. So with that um, sort of setup, we, that's a lot, that's a lot. So I wanna start by asking each of you, how are you taking care of yourself these days? And let's start with you, Lasaya. I didn't know how to take care of myself. Um, and I just want to be honest about that. Um, I didn't know where to start to take care of myself either. It's because I am an OG organizer and the first thing that came to mind is how do I make sure my people are okay? Um, and all of my people, not just one sector of my people. Um, I have an amazing partner that reminds me that he is here to help me. He is here to love on me and love and care for me um, and to remind me that I cannot wear myself out because I do if I do um, I have a whole sector of community that will be left behind um, as a leader in the community so he is here cussing me out <laughs> he is here making me try that I hold myself accountable um, and to making sure that I sleep and, and well fit there's been multiple times during this time that I have not ate for a few days because of the work that I have to do. But he is always on point these days to make sure that I am reminded that I need to eat and take myself and take care of myself. That is indeed a, that is indeed a blessing to have someone who makes you do what you need to do. Uh, what about you, Megan? I was on the double mute. Um, I, I've really been, I feel really connected to food. So it's a interesting transition. I've, I've been cooking a lot nonstop since um, the quarantine started here in New York, cooking for myself, cooking for our neighbors, cooking for uh, our family and, and the folks who uh, we spend time with. And uh, 
it feeds me like nothing else. So I try to make time for it every day uh, and extra time for it on the weekend. <laughs> yeah, I, I can definitely relate to that. We've been doing a lot of more cooking in this household too. Um, how about you, Miles? Yeah, um, for me, um, before everything kind of hit the fan, I actually had the privilege of just coming off of uh, family leave. So one of the lessons that taught me during my pregnancy is when I take care of myself, I'm able to take care of others. So I've been really making sure that I've been checking in with myself. You know, uh, I feel that, you know, the uh, black and brown trans community, you know, even before the pandemic hit, we've been living in this space of uncertainty. So that wasn't, you know, um, too off the norm for me, but it's all the added on heaviness of the, you know, extra trauma and violence that's been going on that I've been really making sure that, you know, every day, you know, I'm checking in with myself, I'm making sure that my family's okay, I'm making sure that I'm eating properly, I'm making sure I'm exercising, meditating, all that good stuff, because once I take care of me and my family, then I'm able to take care of others. Thank you. Um, that is the lesson, right? Uh, when you, I take care of myself, I can take care of others. Uh, what about you, Aisha? Um, so self-care for me has actually changed throughout the course of the pandemic. Um, and just the fact that that has been possible lets you know how long the pandemic has been. Uh, so when we first started sheltering in place, a lot of the things that I turned to to help uh, be taking care of myself or like to, to put in that category of self-care were more so related to like doing my own nails instead of going to the nail salon or uh, trying to figure out if I could braid my own hair instead of going to my hair braider. But um, as time has gone on and I think just the, the length of this isolation and with the added um, additional heaviness of all the uprisings that are going on, my self-care has become more of the cherishing of quiet and purposefully and intentionally being quiet and sitting still. Um, I feel like there's a lot of noise going on. Um, in addition to all of the things that we need to be listening to, there's a lot of static that's also in the air right now. Um, so I've been much more uh, intentional about making sure that I'm spending time by myself well, as by myself as I can get uh, with my cat here, but um, really cherishing that and um, making sure that I stay in touch with my people and check in with them. I think that I have been very fortunate to be surrounded by a few different friend circles who have all been checking in. When we started sheltering in place, I think I was the person in a lot of groups where I was like, yes, let's talk, let's check in, let's do this. And like, I had a lot of momentum when we started. And then after a couple months, I was like, you know what, I'm going to pass the baton. Um, but my friends have been really great at picking it up and making sure that I'm taking care of myself the same way that I checked in with them as we like started sheltering in place. There we go. <laughs> Sometimes that button doesn't want to work. Uh, thank you for that, Aisha. It's, it's funny that you should mention silence because then in the meditation app that we both use, uh, today's uh, mindful moment was silence isn't an absence of noise. It's a quality of mind. Um, so silence, there's some power in silence. Um, so thank you all for, for that check-in. I think it's important as we, the work is hard enough, but then to do it with the overlay of all that's going on, it's important that we check in with our individual selves, our friend circle, and the other folks who uh, we encounter. So Megan, I wanna ask you to talk about um, why the census is, is so important and also the advocacy that I think a lot of people don't know about that the task force has been doing for years now to, to queer up the census. Yeah, thanks. I mean, uh, you know, the task force has been working on the census since 1990, um, when there was first sort of an opportunity to see same-sex couples through uh, census data. Um, and, and they committed to it then for the same reason we're committed to it now, because the census has these huge outsized impacts on how our how our democracy is run, how we are able to access uh, community services, and how um, and how civil rights are enforced across the country. 
so over the last few years, we've been running this career the census campaign, building movements of, of queer and trans uh, groups across the country um, to invest in the census and to understand the impact that it's going to have on us for the next 10 years. Um, and with the with the coronavirus spreading during this census year, uh, we've doubled our investment in it um, because we know that as we're trying to rebuild in the wake of the economic crisis that's happening right now, it is going to become all the more important that we that our folks can get access to those funds that come through the census. Um, and just to give a couple examples, the the census is, the census is used to allocate like a trillion and a half dollars. Um, a year for the programs that our communities need. And they're big dollars for big programs uh, that we need more than than any than most other communities. So the, the census tells the government where to spend ten billion dollars a year in public housing funds. And we know that trans folks are nearly five times more likely to use public housing benefits than cis folks. Uh, it tells the the government when, where to send, you know, 38, $368 billion a year in Medicaid funds. And we know queer and trans folks with disabilities are four times more likely to need uh, access to Medicaid programs. So because of, the, of the, the huge impact that it has on our communities, we've been working on it, on it for a long time. And we do it while biting our tongue because the census is not perfect. It does not ask questions about sexual orientation. It does not ask questions about gender identity. It forces non-binary people to lie. Like your choices are male or female. When I'm filling out the census, I have to lie about my who I am in order to complete that form. But to me, the, the access to political power, the access to, to money for my community um, helps me fight through the, the pain of having to lie about who I am. Um, I, I I appreciate uh, what you're saying, Megan. Not only the the amount of money um, distributed across the country that is based on the census, but also uh, gender and and how um, you know folks are so limited in their expression uh, on the form. And and I guess I want to follow up a little bit to talk to ask you about any um, sort of ongoing efforts to um, make the census form more inclusive. And I know it's work that the task force has been doing for a while now. But um, can you tell us about what's happening going forward? Yeah. So we we were so close before this current administration came into office. We've been fighting for better questions on sexual orientation and gender identity, not just in the census, but in all sorts of surveys and forms uh, that the federal government puts out. And the government was moving in that direction and this current administration shut it down. Um, but we are, we are teed up. When a, when a new administration comes into power and we can only hope that it will happen very soon, uh, we, it is teed up, it is ready to go. The questions of you know, we, they've been through testing, they're ready to put on these, these forms, and we're hopeful that the census will have those questions in 2030, but um, that other forms and surveys will start having those questions as early as 2021. Uh, and actually, a weird outcome of Monday's Supreme Court decision is that uh, the federal government's required to collect data on employment for the purposes of enforcing Title VII. Um, so really, it may make it much easier for us to get those questions onto forms that are related to employment and then the census eventually because of that court decision. Wow. Uh, that is an outcome I had not anticipated. So uh, thank you for, for pointing that out. There goes, an, and I'm going to warn our uh, audience, I live across the street from the fire station, so you may hear some things. We're in Chicago. <laughs> so thank you for that, Megan. I really appreciate um, uh, the the information that you're sharing and we're going to come back to the census in a little bit um, but I want to uh, sort of touch on some of the other areas that are also in the title <laughs> of this discussion so Miles I want to turn to you now and and uh, so as a statewide organization focused on LGBTQ plus rights um, talk to us about some of the ways Equality Illinois has been working through this pandemic, as well as the issues raised during the protests. And also, if this work 
kind of differs uh, depending on where you are in the state having these discussions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, one of the ways that we've had to um, adjust the way that we're working is like everybody else, you know, we've had to go online. Um, which has, to me, uh, I'm a true introvert, so I prefer to be in the house. <laughs> and to me, um, that's actually been a really good thing because since we are a statewide org, since we didn't no longer have the barrier of having a physical location to where our event could be, it opened up our events to so many more people um, from Carbondale all the way up to, you know, uh, Chicago. You know, so that has been a really good thing. And one of the things that we've been hearing from rural communities is, you know, after that, the pandemic only emphasized um, whatever situation you're already going through. So if you're already living in a rural area and already isolated, the pandemic just, you know, emphasized that by like a thousand, you know, so people have been feeling, you know, a lot more isolated. Um, also, some of the things that we've been seeing is, um, just, um, you know, there's a lot of trauma that's happening out there within the community, you know, and uh, since there is a lot of isolation, there's been, uh, you know, people suffering uh, alone, you know, but um, as a statewide org, you know, we will continue, you know, to, through our town halls and other events that we're doing, you know, we will continue to fight for pro-LGBT policies that, you know, uh, can, will further uh, remove barriers that will include improve our quality of life. Uh, we will also continue to build power within our community all throughout the state. And we're gonna be really um, making sure that we're being intentional about uh, emphasizing and amplifying uh, communities of color when we're building that power. And, you know, we will also try to, you know, uplift some of the leaderships that we already have uh, and, and public spheres. You know, we're gonna make sure that, you know, some of the uh, organizations that are on the ground, like, you know, Brace Race Alliance and Howard Brown Health, we're gonna uh, make sure that we're amplifying, you know, their message and what they have going on too. So, you know, we're, we're trying to uh, hit this at all angles. And especially like you were mentioning earlier, this is an election year. And all elections matter. Like we, we see right here in Illinois, the difference a governor could make, you know. So this year, we're really going to uh, try to push for people to get out there to register to vote. This is an important election. And Mike made, gave me a note about this. So I'm going to read it because it's actually huge. So this election is really important because the General Assembly, this election is going to be picked. And their job is going to be to draw the district lines for the state legislator and the Illinois congressional delegates for the following 10 years, which is huge. It's like all these issues that we care about, unless we're making sure that we're putting people in positions of power that can vote on our interests, you know, we're going to be screwed. So we're really pushing for people to go out there and like let our vote be our voice. You know, I always love talking to Mona uh, Noriega because she always says we have to have a good inside out game. So it's like we have to have the boots on the ground protesters, but then we also have the people that are also running to the polls and making sure we're people. Yeah, I thank you for uh, putting Mike's note in this conversation too, because you know some of this stuff just feels so boring and amorphous, and you know what the hell does this have to do with with my life kind of stuff? But a simple thing like a district line makes all the difference in the world. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. <laughs> Let's just own that right now. But but it does, and so these are the things we have to pay attention to, unfortunately, you know, as we are living through um, a pandemic and folks' lives are being turned upside down because truths are coming out that folks didn't always want to deal with. Um, and, and, and not to mention the day-to-day -day stuff that already happens in people's lives, but uh, things kind of run parallel with that and, and have a big impact on each other. And um, uh, Miles, you kind of teed up uh, Aisha for me. So, <laughs> so Aisha, you've kind of become AFC's resident expert on federal policy related to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and you have done an amazing job um, uh, both in your professional life and your Facebook posts and all the things to really connect um, COVID and what's happening in terms of what's being lifted up with the uprising. So talk to us more about these connections to help people see this. Sure. Um, 
one thing that is really uh, interesting and has stood out to me throughout the course of the pandemic, and especially uh, during these uprisings, is that what we're seeing right now isn't something that just started. You know, all of the issues that we're seeing, all the disparities, all the disproportionate effects, um, especially around the mortality rate of the COVID-19 pandemic across the country and around the world, um, as well as uh, just the targeting and killing of Black people, right? Uh, both through state sanctioned violence um, and also through violence from folks who haven't been hired to serve and protect us. Um, so in this moment, we're kind of being forced to observe all of the things that have led to what we're seeing today, right? This is a moment where I've seen more conversations popping up about the social determinants of health, about access to resources, um, all of the things that you know you and I do in our nine to fives when we're talking about trying to make sure people have all the things they need to not only survive but to thrive um, and really be able to live their best life, honestly. Um, and hearing these conversations is uh, it's exciting because it means that now when I talk about all these things to folks and try to advance certain policies, I can point right to the fact that it was able to be done, right? Um, with these uprisings, I feel similarly because we're seeing statues coming down, we're seeing conversations happening. I think this is the first time that I've heard more than five people talk about uh, police and prison abolition um, back to back and not in a, let me play devil's advocate and try to act like this can't exist, but in a genuine, I want to learn more and figure out how we got here place, right? Um, so we're really at an interesting moment where we are able to have these conversations. People are more willing to learn about these things. Um, and we're able to, I guess, shine a light on the history that a lot of us probably, on, well, everyone on this panel, obviously, but a lot of people watching also already knew about, um, but we're now expanding the conversation and bringing more folks in. Uh, I've seen so many posts from people about how they didn't realize how bad healthcare was until so they saw these numbers, or they didn't realize how, um, divested a lot of communities are. They didn't realize how uh, at the local city, county, state, federal level, backs were turned on communities. Um, and then I heard a second wave of that conversation when it came to this police violence and the uprisings that we're seeing. People who were saying, I didn't realize how harmful it could be to have the statues commemorating Confederate people, like Confederate soldiers or leaders. I didn't realize how harmful it could be to have this venerated site for Christopher Columbus, right? Um, having people catch up in these conversations uh, has been very interesting. It's been very exciting. I think that I'm, I feel like the person who like read the novel before you saw the movie, so I knew it was coming. Um, and now other people are starting to get up to speed with it. Um, so it's helpful and it also gives us a really unique opportunity to push things even further. I know that at AFC we've been talking about the ways that we're going to try to um, make sure that these changes and the barrier removals that are happening during the, during the pandemic are codified and stay around because what the pandemic has shown us is that these were just hurdles that were put in place, bureaucracy that was put in place, red tape put in place um, to separate people from the resources that they need. And if we can see that those barriers can be taken down, why ever put them back up? What's the point of making someone's life harder or making it harder for someone to access the things that they need to survive? And the conversation around policing and these uprisings, I, I see like something similar too, right? We're having this come to Jesus moment where you have to look at these budget numbers, look at how many billions of dollars, how military equipment, how schools are being infiltrated by police and law enforcement how policing is not just about law enforcement and badges, but also about the fact that there are so many departments that have been given some policing and authority over our communities as well. So when we're shifting these language, like this language and these conversations and thinking about the ways to really get at the root of these issues, um, I think that there are so many things that are overlapping. And it's not surprising to me to know that uh, the community that is having the highest mortality rate around the COVID-19 pandemic is also being seen as a community that has been targeted relentlessly for centuries. Um, it's not surprising, it is frustrating, but I think that we're in a very unique moment where we're able to pull more folks to our side who might not have been as willing to listen a couple months ago. Thank you for that. And uh, to use your analogy, the, the book is always different from the movie, right? <laughs> and this time, let's hope the movie is better than the book. Um, so thank you for that, Aisha. And now I want to shift from sort of that 
public policy look to uh, an on the ground look and, and really illustrate, as Miles alluded to earlier, this multi, multi stage strategy that we always have to have in, in movement building. And Lasai, I'm going to turn to you. So, Brave Space Alliance has been deeply involved in making sure that trans folks have access to food and other resources uh, since the pandemic started. And we know that BSA has also been deeply involved and become a crucial hub to support protesters, especially during that first weekend of the uprisings. So for, for Brave Space Alliance, what are the connections between all of these efforts, the pandemic, the uprisings, and how they all tie together on the ground? Give me a little bit more context. Context. What do you mean by connected? Uh, so this is a leading question because I know that you see that they are connected. <laughs> so just say whatever they. I was gonna cuss. I'm I'm trying to be good. <laughs> say whatever <laughs> you want to say. <laughs> I just think it's important that, like, regardless of what was happening, was uh, was already happening. Um, and the, now that you're not, now it's in front of you, there's no way to run from it. Um, uh, now that it's on your table, you can't, you, now you have to eat your greens, right? Now you have no other choice but to eat these greens because if you get up, mama's going to come down and smack you in the back of the head. So it's an understanding like right now is a knowing that we did not have food from the beginning, knowing that COVID has taught us how connected we actually really are through water and air. Knowing that we see the oppression of these systems that have been here for folk 500 years and that not only have oppressed black people but also oppressed poor people. But it's a difference between black and poor people at, when my blackness is the number one enemy, right? Um, and how, how I step in these particular spaces and what it looks like. It's a difference between when we understand the narrative of black trans people when we had a black trans woman um, being beheaded in the United States and what that, what that hatred looks like as a trans person. And also black people actually sitting back and like, what, 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 is, is it that much hate um, in our community, not understanding the realization that we are all black at the end of the day? And when we come into this world, our, our, our skin and our bodies are automatically deemed as we have to get rid of this black body um, by any means necessary, by lack of uh, food, lack of uh, Medicaid, lack of resources throughout the South and West Side and also throughout Chicago land, because there's areas in the North Side too that receive these lack of resources that do, do not deem these people worthy. And that comes in this conversation of, we now have a generation that is telling you, uh, I am going to step on your neck until we receive what we have been owed to. Um, you told myself, you told me, you told my mother, you told my grandmother, I got you 40 acres and a mule, but we have yet to see that 40 acres and a mule. Now this generation is saying, you're going to give me my 40 acres and a mule by any means necessary before I get to the age of my parents and my ancestors. So I could pass that down to the generations after me. So we, we, we see this particular connection of like, yo, we've, we've, we've talked enough. We, we, my mother has been nice. The mammies have been nice. We've gave you seasoned salt and pepper. They have been nice to you as well. Um, what has that gotten us? Where has that gotten us? Um, and the equity around what that looks like. So yeah, uh, continue to burn, continue to fight, continue to realize that until you relinquish the power that you thought you had, um, the power is gonna come back to the people and the people are showing you how powerful we actually really are. Well, damn. <laughs> I think that was another drop the mic situation and I, I appreciate you for that. And I appreciate all that, that everyone is contributing to this conversation. And I wanna remind those who are watching uh, to start posting your questions and your comments. Uh, if you're here in Zoom, 
post them in the chat. And if you're on Facebook, go ahead and post them uh, through the live stream. And um, my wonderful colleagues will make sure that that information gets to us. I also would be remiss if I did not mention the, the census website. <laughs> it's my2020census.gov. And I encourage folks to, to go there uh, tonight. It takes about 10-ish minutes. Uh, to fill that out, um, and we're illustrating why some of this is important. And to come back to the census for just a moment, I do want to give folks the opportunity to talk about uh, the work that they are doing, their organizations are doing with the census, especially how you're sort of, uh, again, in the midst of so much going on, sort of pulling people's attention back to the census, right? um, and, and, and making that helping people make that connection to why this is important. So, um, Miles, why don't we start with you? All right. Um, like my grandma always says, a closed mouth don't get fed, right? So I follow no, we're making sure that we're letting people know, you know, we have to let them know that we are here and we need to be counted during this census. I know that, you know, the census is problematic, but we still have to make sure that we're counted in it so that, you know, there's a record of us. And that also goes along with voting. You know, we have to make sure that they're hearing our voice and they're seeing, you know, if we're voting with our values, we're showing them the type of people that we need to be um, holding public office that will vote our interests, you know? So yeah, we, uh, closed mouth don't get fed. We making noise out here. I love that. My grandmother used to say that too. Yeah. Along with a few other things. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, of course it makes sense. <laughs> but now I get it as an older person. I so get that. Um, so uh, Aisha, why don't you talk to us about what AFC is doing? Sure. Um, so AFC is one of the awardees of the YWCA uh, Illinois Department of Human Services Census Grant. Um, so we are one of those subrecipients, and I know that I believe that a few other folks on this panel are too, but I'm not going to say it and get wrong. Um, so part of the, as part of this grant, AFC has worked to incorporate uh, the promotion of the census into our existing programmatic work. Uh, we've already reached over 4,000 individuals through direct services work with clients and digital platforms. Um, and on the digital platforms, we've been sharing blog posts, Facebook posts, Instagram, uh, and we've also been doing some phone banking. Um, and then in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, AFC is also distributing over 5,000 masks promoting the census. Um, and so those are going out into Chicago neighborhoods that are at a greater need for resources. Uh, so this is a conversation that's been happening in AFC. Um, the census is extremely important, like Miles said, like Megan said, um, there are some issues with the form right now, but again, we have to we have to use what we've got in this moment and keep fighting for what we deserve going forward. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing to, the, to do this work, especially because the census response period has been extended uh, this year. So people are able to continue to fill it out through October um, as opposed to it ending in the summer like it usually does. Thank you for that reminder about the extension. Um, Lasaya, how about Free Space Alliance? What are we not doing? <laughs> it is like mind boggling right now. We do not receive any funds from the city and the state right now um, due to the fact that the city and state has denied us multiple times on many levels. Um, the state also has, the state and the city has said that we are deemed not worthy because I am a black trans woman at leadership. Um, but we have proven during this particular time that we have not only can serve, um, not only our community, but bridge the gap between other communities as well. Our pantry has not only served 4,000 at the beginning of this crisis, but we have not, we have served over 15,000 as of last week. The numbers have counted throughout Chicago land. Um, we have over 3,000 volunteers that not only help us drop off bags weekly to these people, to, but also to make sure that no one goes hungry in this time and the need has become greater. Um, we have also shown how, how people power actually can maneuver and change the city. Um, we have partnered with uh, uh, Center of Halstead, 
uh, Affinity, and many other organizations to make sure um, that all of our people are completely fed. A AFC as well have noticed to make sure people on the ground continue to get what they need. We have a trans relief fund that has delivered over $100,000 to people that are on the ground to make sure they have, they get their paid, um, not only get paid, but also be able to get something uh, uh, or a bill paid in this particular climate because we know how capitalism does not stop. Um, because of the leadership that are in are in place. I don't do voting. Voting is not my standard. Um, that is why we have Aisha and Miles on this uh, on this panel because I say burn the system down unless we start all over. That's how I roll. Um, um, because for me, the system has never been in place to uh, or was created. <clears throat> to help black or brown people. Um, so that's how I maneuver. But a BSA is now, right now, doing our building campaign. We are fundraising for $800,000 um, to renovate our office and also to make sure that this pantry is permanent on the south and west side. We are actually working with, um, we're actually working with Project Vita to be our second place um, for our pantry due to the 20 years of um, friendship that they had with Heartland Alliance and they counseled that. And so they have people over there that are hungry right now. Um, I have to bring that into visualizations because that we have organizations that are refusing to understand um, the people are in need right now more than ever. And if we cut off our resources to the people that are in need, we are not doing what we are supposed to be doing for the people. So we not only have to hold ourselves accountable, we have to hold our organizations accountable and the organizations that we work with accountable. And if we're not doing that, then we're not moving forward. Amen. <laughs> Sometimes the, the work is within as well as without, right? Uh, and I want to lift up that you said uh, Brave Space Alliance wasn't getting any city or federal funding. And, and I think you are showing that you're going to keep moving no matter what. And I guarantee the city or the state is going to be knocking on your door uh, pretty soon because you keep doing the work and, and you're attracting funding from other places keep moving. Um, Megan, uh, I know Task Force is doing a ton of stuff around the census, but why don't you go ahead and highlight some other, some other things? Yeah, I mean, we are, we are pretty much all census all the time right now um, and are also can sort of shifting some of our census work into uh, get out the vote and voter engagement work at the same time. Um, but I just want to list up one thing uh, around census that we're doing that people might not be thinking about as much, which is uh, working with both the Census Bureau and uh, state and local advocates across the country to make sure that people who are experiencing homelessness get counted. Uh, the Census Bureau has a real small window when they say that they try to count people experiencing homelessness, but they don't actually reach out to communities beforehand and let folks know that it's going to happen. And so then people are legit uh, kind of afraid to talk to these, these folks that are coming out from the government to count in communities. So we're working with cities and states to make sure that um, people who are currently experiencing homelessness actually know that this is gonna come and that they can and should get counted if they want to, um, because the census drives funding for, for programs like emergency and transitional housing, for um, uh, housing opportunities for people living with HIV and AIDS, for public housing, for, for basically all the programs that, that make up the homelessness continuum of care. So if we're not getting counted, uh, that money's not getting to the places that need it most. Wow, there's that count again. Um, thank you, thank you all for sharing uh, that information. And, um, now, I think at this point, we're going to take a little pause in the panel so we can get another performance from Story. And then um, afterwards, we're going to open it up for questions for a little bit uh, before coming back to the panel for some closing remarks. So Story, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next, um, the next actual piece that I'm going to perform is actually called Everything is Beautiful. Everything is Beautiful. <laughs> Them that's God shall gain. 
them that's not shall lose. So the Bible says, and it still is news. Mama may have, and Papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own. That's got his own. I write. And then, then I erase. Replacing words heard before in other pieces and in other places. You see, I need to breathe for me some kind of newness or maybe even a blessing beyond these musings. Use magnifying glasses to find clues in my own cluelessness while I sit and I brew in it. And then I'll begin to write these random visualizations on a regular old blank sheet of paper, unruled for my run-ons and revelations. That's why my mind jet sets to the ruins in the East. Within me grows this desperate need to be re-earthed and be born again. And when I return to these stages, I plan to bring about a new age of poetry, a revolutionary prose for the lonely awaiting to be awakened. And if God will allow it, I will walk into it willingly. Because I already know what it's like to not be paid. And you have these gigs for a stage for all thinkers visionaries or wishes or maybe even artists with visions of spitting in the motherland returning to that motherland speaking one universal language one universal plan so i'd be damned if i didn't give these dreams a chance they have stripped us naked until there was nothing left but one shirt two pair of hands my music collection and a CTA seven day bus pass. They took me from my home and still I rested easy in God's hands, scribing these atrocities into blessings. See, you fuel this fire, then you cash checks later because the true value is in the contents of what you create, or at least that's what I thought. So while the opposition enters my position, I just move to the left and you let them have their own mentions. I'm like Pontius Pilate. I want my hands clean. I keep it tranquil, serene, and subdued. And to the contrary, I just got better to do. I'm uncalculated like new math. I'm steadfast and lasting. Any walls built, I'm coming through blasting because I'm passing stages of psychological rhetoric. I provide the bruises of my heart directly from my art. That's why I write with discretion from my heart. I love from each chamber of my heart. I am a living vessel because I've grown tired of losing and then confusing rejection instead of fusing progression with being connected to a master that's why you keep it all by the wayside everything is beautiful even until the very day that you die from every moment of dozing and reawakening our stories are dipped in the absence of jism when we simply just need to feel freely execute the plans that i sent then I'll plan for the disappointment. And when it burns, there God stands with an ointment to send a cooling to my soul, because anything the devil stole returns to me sevenfold. That's why I sometimes reckon that pain can be a very good thing. It admonishes us that we are still in the land of living. The strong gets more, while the weak ones fade. Empty pockets don't ever make the grave. Mama may have, 
and Papa, he may have, yes, he did. But God bless the child that's got his own, that's got his own. Thank you. Story. Thank you. You are the reason artists need to be at every gathering. <laughs> you have said so much in in a couple of minutes. I mean, it's I, I, I need a transcript of that. I mean, you just preached. <laughs> Amen. And, and I thank you so much for sharing your gift with us. Thank tonight you. Because I just you know there are many panels and many discussions that are had, but for me, if you don't bring artists in the mix, you ain't doing it. So thank you so much for, for being a part of tonight. I appreciate you so much. I thank you so very much. And before I, I, before I let you guys go, I just want to add something to you, Kim. Thank you so much for having me because these kinds of discussions are so important. And listening to all these different panelists with all their perspectives and all their everything that they're doing, it's so necessary right now and mm -hmm. artists are the ones that reflect the time so what you guys are talking about we go out and we perform it and we give it to the people that don't comprehend that so if we can put it in a song or a poem or even rag time i'm going to give you exactly the truth exactly the way we know it is so god bless you thank you so much and i love y'all so much thank you aids foundation and thank you kim you guys are amazing you will be Thank back you. with us one day, honey. Don't you worry. Thank you. This is not goodbye. This is just so long for now. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So we're going to turn to some questions before we come back to these amazing panelists. And I see some questions popping up. And unless they uh, reference a specific person, anyone who feels comfortable and has something to say, can answer the question. So the first one is, uh, uh, what fears have LGBTQ plus people, particularly trans and non-binary people expressed in regard to surveillance through the census? And how do we address those fears? And, and Megan, maybe we should start with you because you're, get, you're getting that national perspective. So what are what are you hearing? Yeah, I mean we've we've heard uh, a lot of fears from a lot of folks around the country, and um, you know they're the same they're the same fears we heard in 2010, and the same fears we heard in 2000, and the same fears we heard in 1990, just bigger. Um, so people are afraid that the data they share on the census will be shared with law enforcement, that it'll be shared with immigration enforcement, that it'll be shared with their landlord, and that their landlord will find out there's more people living in the house than they, you know, reported on their um, on their form when they signed up. They're afraid it's their data is going to be shared with public benefits. Um, and, and in past censuses, the way that we addressed that was by talking about the confidentiality laws that exist to protect census data. Census data are protected for 72 years under, under federal, federal law. That's a strong law. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't land with folks right now. Like saying the federal government's going to protect your data, that does not land with folks. Uh, but one cool thing is that uh, MALDEF, the Me Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, in partnership with Asian Americans Advancing Justice and about 200 other organizations came together to create a confidentiality pledge that they are standing behind the confidentiality protections that they will fight them on our behalf if the, if anything is to happen with the data. And to me, that, that gives me a little bit more confidence in that confidentiality than just the legal protections in place. I'll drop a link to that in the chat for folks. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to jump in on that because um, something that I have a cat, she's very vocal. Hey, um, uh -huh. Something that was just mentioned is around the privacy and security of the uh, information that's collected from the census. And that those protections were already in place. Um, but I think that this year it's been a unique uh, situation because folks have been pushing filling out the census online so much. And I know that there were a lot of specific questions about. Um, how that data will be protected, whether there's enough infrastructure to ensure that people's data is protected in that form. Um, I will say that the Census Bureau 
made a statement that you know the data stays within that agency within that department that it's not being shared um, another concern that came up not specifically for trans and non-binary people but for uh, people who are worried about immigration status or documentation uh, there were concerns about sharing the information with the department of homeland security or ice and that is not a thing that happens it's uh it's illegal um I'm not going to say that things being illegal means that it's going to stop anything from happening. So let me go ahead and preface that, uh, especially with this administration. But I will say that if something like that did happen, there would already be recourse in place uh, to handle that. Another concern that came up that I've heard a few times around the census this year is um, that the Census Bureau is going to track IP addresses to try to ensure that there's no fraud. Um, that raised some concerns for folks because a few library systems, including Chicago Public Libraries, planned on having um, space and providing opportunities for people to come in and fill out the census if they did not have access to uh, a secure like internet, um, internet access at home or if they are not um, safely housed or if they just don't have access to those resources. Um, whether having multiple people fill it out from the library's IP address would cause them to be uh, removed or discredited or not counted that's not a thing either so a few because that issue was raised a few different times um, and there are spaces that are kind of designated as hubs for people to go in and fill out the census um, that's not really a thing that we're as concerned about right now again this administration is not one that we feel very comfortable making solid statements about in these regards um, but the, the conversations are, have already been happening around making sure that people's information is guarded and that they're actually accurately counted. Wow. Thank you for that addition. And I, I do want to remind people, it is an election year, but to Lasaya's point, uh, the work doesn't end <laughs> with the election. You still got to hold people up accountable. So, um, y'all, come on. I know not everybody wants to vote. Those of us who do, let's do that. Let's show up because we got to get the orange Venice out um, <laughs> because of his policies. I had to add that as a 501c3 representative. Um, <laughs> someone asked, what are some examples of census funded resources that LGBTQ people rely on in Illinois and Chicago? Um, I'm happy to jump in on this one too. Uh, just because I've been talking about this for so many months now. Um, but the thing about the funding that's coming from the census and the resource that it, it actually impacts is that um, there aren't necessarily that many specific resources that are focused for LGBTQ plus people um, based on the designation, just because the census doesn't actually gather that information properly. But I will say that the things that it affects always impact all of our lives. Um, anyone in the LGBTQ population is gonna be affected by the apportionment of the funding that comes down based on the census. So you wanna be counted because that uh, determines how much money the state and the city get. It affects redistricting. So if in places, especially like Chicago and in the state of Illinois, we're at risk of losing uh, up to three representatives federally. Um, so that would, be a very big issue. Um, we're very concerned about something like that happening, especially because one of those uh, seats might come from the Chicago area. So it's not just about Central Illinois or Southern Illinois, it might actually come from the Chicago uh, Chicagoland area. It also affects the, um, the funding that comes to states and local communities around health, education, housing, and infrastructure programs. So anything that you would access under those umbrellas um, would be hit by the census results. Planning for cities is also impacted by the census and also emergency responses and figuring out where other federal, federal surveys need to go and how many people they should expect to fill those out. So when we're talking about the ways that uh, the money goes somewhere, when we're talking about um, how the funding looks uh, and we're saying that these very broad categories are being impacted, um, just remember that Every day, something that you experience is probably impacted by the census. And to give a little bit of a more specific uh, example of how this could impact the, the queer community, um, that health funding can also be part of the funding that goes to federally qualified health centers like Howard Brown, right? So if you ever thought that Howard Brown needs to expand or needs to be able to provide additional services, the filling out of the survey will help you ensure that a place like Howard Brown is able to continue to function the way that it is. So even though it's not specifically earmarked as you know, LGBTQ funding uh, specifically, 
it still hits us every single day. Thank you for that, uh, the, the overview, but also the very specific example for folks. I'm gonna ask one more question from the chat before we go back to the panel for, for um, uh, sort of a wrap up question. And that in, and there are lots of resources popping up in the chat. This is great. Thank you. Thank you all for putting them there. What hopes do our panelists have for future censuses, which is hard to say, in regard um, to additional ways for people to accurately self identify? And what related the question is, is that important? Did I reread that or did folks get it? I get it, and I think that um, future censuses, I hope that they collect the information that folks want collected, right? I don't want it to become a situation where people are forced to uh, disclose information that they don't want to. Of me, you always have the um, ability to just not fill it out, but I do hope that there is more information collected so that when we're talking about actually designating funding for certain uh, communities, or to make sure that we have the resources that we need in a lot of the queer communities around uh, both the, the state of Illinois, but also the country itself, um, that can happen. So without having the numbers, the data, the information about folks, folks and how they identify under the LGBTQ plus umbrella, um, it's not easy for us to be able to point to and say, hey, we need this, this additional funding for this issue that we're facing as a community. Um, so I just hope that there is an expansion of the, the information that folks are able to provide without folks being forced to disclose anything that could um, either put them in harm's way or make them feel insecure about what they're sharing. Anyone want to add to that? Just, um, you know, a couple additions that, well, not additions, really, just uh, on the, along the same lines that, you know, I, I, I hope that the census collects sexual orientation and gender identity some, someday. Um, but even, even those questions that have been tested that are on the pathway really still don't reflect all of our identities. Um, there's a good gender identity question that's ready to go at the, you know, on surveys, but it doesn't include any response options for non-binary folks. So for you know, good chunk of us, um, folks who identify as non-binary, folks who identify as intersex, folks who identify as two-spirit. There, there aren't questions that um, that folks are proposing even that that include those sorts of response options. So there's still a lot of work to to go, even if they include sexual orientation and gender identity questions in their current form. Um, and just the other piece that I'm hopeful that we'll be able to move in a new administration is. Under Obama, they were they were going to radically change how they collect race and ethnicity data to to combine the race and ethnicity questions to add a response option for people who identify as Middle Eastern North African, and the Trump administration shut that down too. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to move both of those forward as soon as an, a new administration is in place. Uh, Megan, that, that reminds me, you know, uh, Task Force does this amazing national work. How can local organizations get involved in that work? Well, there's definitely, um, obviously, please come to our website, sign up, we'll, we'll hook you in. And uh, all of this work needs to happen at the state and local level too. National data is really limited in its efficacy. Like there's, the Census Bureau is never gonna be the best at co collecting community-based data. Uh, and in fact, state governments are not gonna ever be the best at collecting <laughs> community-based data. So I would say if there's one thing people can do in their own communities, it's support uh, community-based data collection, which we know is the best source of actual information about our people. Good point. Uh, thank you for that. So this last question is for everyone. Uh, and I'm gonna start with you, Lasaya. So <laughs> describe your hope for LGBT plus communities, especially black trans women, on the other side of this pandemic and as we continue to grapple with the issues that once again have been raised through the movement for Black Lives. I'm scared to describe my hopes. 
because we still deal with colorism in a way that dark skin or brown skin black trans women are not respected um, and are utilized as workers instead of utilized as leaders and and deemed not worthy or respected unless we're for entertainment um, my hope is for the darkest, fattest, beardest trans woman in the deepest part of Africa is freed. Because when she's freed, I'm freed. Um, and if she's not freed, I will never be free. Um, my hope goes into that every trans person has a job that is worthy and respected. Um, no matter what they look like to society, deem them as norm or not, they're respected when they walk outside. Um, my hope is not to have this lingering, will I make it back home because someone knows who I am. Um, yeah, that's my hope. I, we have a lot of work to do, just not to talk about transness also to talk about the intersections of colorism in transness and who's palatable and who's not when we don't normally, we don't push them conversations like we're supposed to. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, that's my hope is to really in, involve in them conversations and holding people accountable when, when it's just, <laughs> it's hard because I have a sister, Shigeisha Diamond, which is a singer, and she's dark skinned, beautiful trans woman, and she's turning into a celebrity into our community when when she steps into particular spaces and she shakes someone's hand. She shook someone's hand because I was there to witness this, and this other light skinned trans woman said, "Oh, you're greasy." Um, and, and as a person that has a partner that is dark skin, it, it brings the realization that we have a lot of work to do, not only within our own community, but also within our full all black community around who shall take the podium and who shouldn't and who has enough radical education to make sure they lead us all and we all are leading each other into liberation. So that's my hope. Wow, thank you for, for naming so many things that, that we don't talk about and putting it right there in the center of the conversation. Um, Miles, same question for you. Yeah, um, to kind of piggyback off of what Lasai was saying, you know, I keep hearing all these people say, you know, I can't wait till things just go back to normal. And I don't want things to go back to normal, you know? What normal is, is my community feeling unsafe, my community being murdered, my community being overlooked, my community not being protected. So until the community collectively realizes, like what I was saying, the, the darkest, the biggest, the poorest, until we make sure that we're centering and building them up, you know, the, the fight will go on. And we have to make sure that we continue with the momentum of this fight too, and centering, and like I said, building up those voices. So my hope is um, we keep moving forward, and forget about this idea of nor like go back to normal that we have in our in our mind and really help dismantle both legal and cultural systems of oppression because you know it, it's hard out here and we just need to keep moving forward. Thank you for that. Uh, Megan, same question. Yeah, you know, I think it's not um, it's not to to me to define the, the hopes of what our tomorrow looks like. It's, it's to me to, to listen in and support the folks in my community um, that are still building their power. Uh, so I, my hope is that, that y'all's hopes are realized. Thank you for that. And Aisha. It's hard to go last on this question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, my hope is for uh, a liberation that exceeds my wildest dreams, right? I want a future that I can't even imagine yet because it is so perfect 
right? And I hate to use the word perfect, but that's what I mean. Like, I want there to be a time and a space where Black love doesn't have to be radical, where Black joy is not something that we have to remind each other to witness and experience and recognize, where we don't have to wonder if when we lose someone, whether they will be remembered, uh, where I don't have to wonder if the people that I am marching for and fighting for and speaking up with and shouting with and on the front lines with, where I don't have to wonder if they will do the same thing for me because I've already seen it happen and I already trust that it will. Um, I want a liberation that exists outside of all of the harmful, deadly, structures that have come about because of white supremacy, because of capitalism, because of anti-blackness. Um, and I also hope that it is a liberation that's not bound by borders. I want a liberation where we're not worried about where someone was born. We're not worried about what they looked like when they were born. We're not worried about anyone being designated in one way or another. Um, I hope for a liberation where no one else has to remember a story that they were told, uh, like I was when I was born in DC at uh, George Washington University Hospital um, and had a doctor look my father in the face and tell him that I was almost perfect. And then my father rushed to count my fingers and toes and make sure I had all of the parts that he was looking for and he couldn't spot anything wrong. And the doctor was like, oh, it's because she's colored. I hope for a liberation where that story is so strange and so foreign that no one can even imagine what it would feel like to hear that repeated to them. You know, um, I want a liberation where we don't have to worry about if people can meet their needs. I want to work myself out of my job, basically. I don't want there to have to be a, an AIDS Foundation in Chicago. There shouldn't have to be a, uh, a center that is only focused on Black trans women because people have been so unfocused on Black trans women. Um, so yeah, I, uh, that's me. That's, that's what I'm hoping for. I want that future to exist. I don't know if I'm going to see it, but I believe that it will come about. Well, I, I appreciate you for naming all the things. Uh, I think that's a good note to wrap up on. Uh, this has been a very, very rich conversation uh, for me. I hope it has been for you. I hope it has been for the audience too. Uh, I want to thank the talented and amazing Story Devereaux for offering her artistry tonight. I also want to thank our panelists, Aisha Davis, Miles Brady Davis, Megan Murray, and Lasaya Wade. Thank you also to the behind the scenes wizardry of Deontay's Keys, Jack. Rothman and Jackie Thaney. Uh, thank you also to our co-sponsors, Howard Brown Health and AIDS Foundation of Chicago and our funders, uh, Forefront and YWCA. There's never enough time for these conversations. This has been an amazing one. And Pride Action Tank will be hosting part two of the census COVID-19 and beyond resilience and vulnerability in LGBTQ plus communities at this same time next Wednesday, June 24th. And that day, our focus will be on the intersecting issues of the LGBT plus older adults and youth. Um, remind folks again, fill out the census form, my2020census.gov. Um, uh, please step out there and vote in November uh, and do all the things that we need to do to, to make all of the, the hopes come true that folks have articulated. And I wish you all a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.